Hello, everyone, and welcome. I have a lot of people signing in right now, as always, with these webinars. So just give it another minute, and then we're going to go ahead and get started. I think we'll start at two minutes after the hour. So as soon as the clock strikes two after, we'll start. All right, here we go. Welcome. Okay, so if you came here to see the SEA series United by Sustainability, you are in the right place. Next slide. In this, um, in this series, I wanted to emphasize that we put this together as a place to come together and an opportunity for learning. Obviously, this is a time of great uncertainty. But I wanted to also mention the series is open to anyone interested in sustainability and specialty coffee, whether you're an expert or just becoming interested. And on behalf of the SCA, welcome, and we're glad you're here. So just a little bit about the series. Um, we will be offering this at regular times every week with a little bit of exception, um, which I'll mention in a second. So every Tuesday and Thursday we'll meet. Tuesdays will be at this time, 8 a.m. Pacific time. Thursdays at 3 a.m. Pacific time and 12 midday or noon Pacific time. Um, we're doing that 3 a.m. session. Uh, Kim and I are both in the Eastern time zone of the U.S., so it's 6 a.m. for us, so not quite as difficult. And um, this is also a better time to reach our uh, communities in the Middle East, throughout Asia and Australia and New Zealand, although it is a bit late in the evening for that part of the world, um, that it's definitely better than having it in the middle of the night like it is right now. <clears throat> so each session is going to start with a brief update on any emerging resources or updates around COVID-19 which I will do now. Um, I'm going to take this opportunity to direct your attention to the PDF available for download on your GoToWebinar dashboard. This will have links to current resources for the SCA community related to COVID-19. So our comms team has made it really easy by creating a community-driven resources page. This is contributed to people all over the world. And this one link that is in your PDF actually provides many links, including those specific to types of coffee businesses, specific regions or local communities, GoFundMes, mental health news, online events, inspiration pieces, and a whole lot more. There is so much here. I really encourage everyone to check it out. We'll ho we hope you'll take a look. Um, it's worth noting most of these resources currently are in English, but we welcome submissions and resources in any language. And you'll also see that the, as of today, the calendars for SCA have been updated. And there's some information about that in the PDF as to um, just kind of trying to emphasize the online community gatherings and ways to find those types of events easily, as well as updates on events that have been postponed or canceled within the SCA community. Okay, now it's finally time to introduce ourselves. Hi, um, I'm the host of this series, Ellie Hudson from the SEA staff. I'm the Sustainability Projects Director. I recognize many of you. You might recognize me from other roles in my long tenure at SEA and in our community. I'm happy to see many familiar names on the attendee list as well as new ones. Um, before I introduce our esteemed speaker today, I wanted to acknowledge the many additional SEA staff who have contributed to making this series a reality. Thank you to Julie Hausch, Sierra Hatcher, Pernilla Gard, Vicente Partida, Heather Ward, Peter Giuliano, Jen Rogolo, Stephen Morrissey, and Katie Golding. Today, our discussion will be led by Kim Elena Ionescu, my colleague and friend, our leader in sustainability at the SCA, and another familiar face to those of you who have been following the work of the PCR or SCA Sustainability. Kim is our Chief Sustainability and Knowledge Development Officer. Hi, Kim. Hi, Ellie. 
I'm also running the slides. So any issues that you have with the slides, you can blame those on me. Like I didn't actually mean to just advance it a second ago. I was trying to find my unmute button because I knew I would need that. Um, so thanks for, for bearing with me. All right. Um, so in today's session, we are, this is the first one that we're doing and, um, and it's an introduction. And um, we're gonna focus on exploring the questions that are listed here um, and giving some background and kind of a, a big picture context to what are we talking about when we talk about sustainability? Why are we doing this? Um, how is sustainability evolving in these times which have already been acknowledged on this, uh, this webinar as being uncertain times? Um, and, uh, and what is the, the role of sustainability at this time? So, um, as I was thinking about this yesterday and over the past week or two that we've been talking about uh, talking about this webinar series, I mean, the first reason I think to do this is um, is a pretty simple one, and it's not sustainability specific. It's um, it's to satisfy that desire for connection, um, and we see that in all sorts of different ways. And um, and I certainly feel that you know sitting at home and and working from home, which is familiar to me, but. Um, the desire to connect is one of the reasons that we're doing this and uh, webinars are certainly familiar to uh, to sustainability. We've done a lot of these um, over the years and uh, part of that is because we've always as a as a department as a, a discipline had a very um, international audience or, or international participation and and buy in and, and seeing the stakeholders as um, as global so um, webinars are a familiar way for us to uh, connect even when in-person events are an option and we're doing both of those things. Um, so we wanted to do these webinars because it was a, a way in which we could immediately uh, jump into action and do something that we, we knew how to do um, and create these opportunities for connection and for discussion. Um, because, you know, I, I have a lot to say. I think that uh, probably a lot of people on this uh, Call have a lot to say, but um, but the connection that I'm I'm seeking and I, that I think is uh, potentially one of the valuable assets that this format offers is that we can talk to and and listen to each other, um, and that that's especially important as things are uh, changing what feels like a, a daily basis, um, but uh, but certainly in the big picture arc of you know of sustainability, I think that we're seeing. Um, now some challenges emerging from areas of, if we look at coffee, the industry and the coffee supply chain, where we have been, or we haven't been looking for them in the past. And that doesn't mean that they haven't been there. But since I joined the association five years ago, I've been asked frequently, you know, what are the sustainability priorities of the association or how does the association choose? Or even sometimes I get this question about how the association defines sustainability which is a, a subject for a, another discussion. Um, but, uh, but my answer has frequently sounded something like, well, you know, sustainability is a really big umbrella and there are so many different interpretations and so many ways in which to, um, to act and, uh, and live in pursuit of a, a more sustainable way of being. Um, but we as an association look at the landscape of sustainability in the industry and we see that the threats are really concentrated on the production side of the supply chain. So that's where most of the SEA sustainability work has focused versus something that is very you know, uh, retail specific. There are resources that we have uh, that we've created, there are certainly you know, lectures that take place at our events, but um, the, the larger, you know, um, Local areas have been on production side sustainability issues, um, but now you know we're in this this moment where we see so clearly it's brought into such sharp focus how much vulnerability there is in um, on the other side of the supply chain also. And like I said, I mean that's that's been there. It's not that it's it's new or that it's been invisible, um, but uh, but this one event. Has, um, has revealed so much about what's been lying beneath the surface. And um, while that makes it, I think uh, I presented it as a challenge, well, it makes it hard um, because it, uh, it shows us that, in fact, we have maybe more work to do than we, than we realized, or we have a whole new set of, uh, of issues presenting themselves. I think that also, you know, 
knowing this and being able to draw parallels when it's appropriate um, and being able to incorporate this into our thinking gives us a better chance of succeeding in whatever the work is that we are we're setting out to do and in uh, charting uh, you know our way toward a future that that is sustainable um, I think when it comes to uncertainty you know sustainability is inherently uncertain because we are talking about creating a future that has to be different than the present and has to be different than the past so we can use information and um, and knowledge in the present and information from and knowledge from the past to inform our decisions about the future but you know the idea that we're going to know with 100 percent certainty and we're never going to change our course or that there isn't an enormous amount of risk involved in that um, it would just be impossible to make that kind of a that kind of guarantee and so in that sense i think that um while there is probably a, a desire by many to uh, to turn inward and think very you know very short term and very very specifically um that uh we can you know we can counterbalance that certainly as the uh, as the coffee association we can offer some some counterbalance of, of long-term thinking and um and interconnectedness and uh and finding those intersections between you know what it is that we are individually experiencing now and um and what the the long-term future has to hold for coffee and specialty coffee to be sustainable so we're all in this together on a large scale as well as here in the webinar um, i see that there are already a couple of hands raised so thank you for that and you also have the option of submitting your questions through the chat during the discussion, um, Sierra Hatcher will be handling the questions and uh, I will be reading them. And I will also handle the uh, raised hands so you can kind of talk to Kim through us. And um, when we read your question, if you submit it through the chat, we will identify you by first name. Um, so for example, Kim said, and then we would read the question, um, if you would like to remain anonymous, you can change your name in the GoToWebinar panel so that it just says anonymous or, um, you know, you can change it to anything and, um, or you can just say so in your chat, please don't read my name or just make sure that we can see that you wish to remain anonymous and we will honor that. We are going to be launching two polls in this webinar live. The polls are anonymous. So you'll see the real time feedback as people submit their answers and as that goes in, but it's not identified with any user and we, we have no idea who says what. <clears throat> All right, so um, in a way of kind of getting started with our discussion, we thought we would highlight um, something that came in from SCA's recent survey. Many of you um, may have participated in this survey. And just before I share this one slide, which is a, a quick highlight from that survey, I wanted to mention that we will be producing a webinar, our colleagues in the research division will be producing a webinar specific to everything having to do with the survey. So you'll get a lot more information about that. So please keep an eye on SCA social media for when that webinar will be happening. It um, should be sometime soon. <clears throat> so we wanted to share this um, finding this, as you can see, 449 respondents. So this was throughout um, the different areas of the coffee sector and globally. <clears throat> Just give you a second to kind of read through this. So almost 90% um, somewhat significantly or existentially negative. Uh, with the vast majority, huge majority responding significantly negative. Um, I don't think anyone was surprised, but all, this is very um, alarming and sobering to look at uh, this threat to our community across many sectors. So I think this is just something that um, we hope that if nothing else, we know that we're not alone in this, um, but we have a very serious threat to, to wrestle with um, in this pandemic. Uh, 
All right, so in order to start our discussion, let's hear a little bit about um, our audience here. So as the previous slide and the survey response indicate, the whole world, um, including how the coffee sector approaches sustainability. So that um, the survey was about business generally. And now we're gonna ask you all to talk to us a little bit about um, the role of sustainability in your organization. I'm gonna keep this open for one to two minutes. About 30% voted ticking up very quickly. Now we're up to 50%. 68, 69%, 70, 71. Come right. on. 76. Great job, everybody. We have 250 plus people here, so <clears throat> want to make sure that we give everyone time to read through the responses. All right, we're up to 80%. Keep it open for another couple of, maybe another 30 seconds. All right, votes are still coming in, so I want to keep it open. Up to 86%. Great job, everyone. 87. All right, 10 more seconds, and then I'm going to close it down. Can we get to 90%? 80, 88. Like this is a pledge drive or something, you know. I know, right? Okay. Can you see the results? Yes, I can. I think that nobody else would be able to answer, right? Because everyone's muted. Yeah. So I'll read out um, that uh, the results show that 67% of people uh, answered that it was important before COVID-19 and is still equally important. 16% uh, say that it's uh, it was important, but is less so now. 7% say it was not important and is more important now. 3% um, was not important before, not important now, so pretty small percentage. And 8% are unsure. Um, so thanks everyone for uh, for responding to that. Um, uh, I think uh, just taking a look at this, I will say that I'm heartened by the fact that it was uh, important to so many of you before and that it's still equally important. I mean, um, you know, you self-selected into a webinar about sustainability. So I would uh, imagine that because of that, um, you have some interest in the topic and, uh, and that it would have been important, but that uh, a much larger group of you answer that it's still important now, although, you know, maybe maybe it's changed. Um, and a, a smaller group says that it's uh, that it's less important now. And um, and I would imagine that that's largely due to the, just the available bandwidth and the um, and the priorities, and um, that many people might like it to might like to have the same sort of uh, bandwidth or capacity to dedicate to it, but might feel stretched and um, and un unable to at this moment. Um, I'm really curious about the uh, the people who answered that it was not important before and is more important now. I think that that's a group that um, you know, uh, it's that it's uh, and there's an opportunity there. You know, in these moments where um, where a big event occurs and uh, and it causes a um, a lot of rethinking to happen, and some of that is very is very painful, and some of that is um, you know leads to um, to outcomes that we would not have chosen under any circumstance. But I think that there are also ways in which it can. Um, prompt a rethinking that leads to um, new ideas and uh, and um, 
new ways of, of working and, and sort of new business models even. Um, and then I'll, uh, I'll, you know, leave it at that and, uh, and move on to the, um, the open discussion where we are going to hear from you all. So um, in light of this, uh, the shifting that's happening and, um, and the fact that so many of you answered that sustainability was important before and it continues to be important now, um, you know, we'd love to hear from you how you see your role in sustainability because as I already acknowledged, there are so many different interpretations uh, based on in, in coffee where you sit in the, uh, in the supply, the value stream, um, where you uh, live in the world, um, what age you are. I mean, there are so many factors that play into the actions that you are able to take and the impacts that you are able to have. And so, you know, while, um, while I, I already said that we as the SCA sometimes make choices about where to dedicate our resources and what our greatest impacts are, um, I'd love to know from, uh, from some of you all on this, uh, who are participating in this webinar, how you see your role in sustainability and where you think that, um, that you are able to have the most impact, either individually or in the context of the, the company or the organization that you, um, that you work with. So um, the reminder here to yeah. submit questions through the chat, raise your hand. Ellie? We have a couple of hands raised already. Um, some folks who might, whose arms might be getting a bit tired. Um, so I'll start with Martha, who has her hand raised. Martha, did you have a question? Perhaps the question was answered. Um, and then we also have a couple of questions um, that came in. Let's, um, this one came from Liron. Liron, sorry, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. So Kim, I'll read you the question and give you a chance to respond. And then Liron, if you wanted to um, uh, respond after that, then I will unmute you. So here's the question. Do you believe change will be achieved by a top-down approach, i.e. governmental, or a bottom-up consumers, or do you believe that it needs a combination of both? I feel like, so this is the first question, and I feel like I'm going to answer it in a way that, uh, that may be common, depending on uh, what other questions we receive during this hour or during this series, which is, um, that it's probably the most complicated of the answers. <laughs> you know, it's probably the one that I'm going to tend to choose. Um, I think this is a great question. It doesn't uh, a complex answer doesn't mean that it wasn't a good question. I think that um, you know, you get to um, that balance or that uh, the fact that there are some initiatives where you know, top down government, you know, public sector leadership is um, is really what's needed and uh, and they have a unique opportunity to to act or um, a, a reach that a, an individual private sector actor wouldn't have. So um, I think that there is absolutely a case where we can't substitute as uh, much as we might like to, as potentially thinking about this uh, audience, probably more private sector representatives. Um, we can't substitute for a, a government intervention, but um, we can think about things that we have the ability to do. Um, how can we leverage supply chain relationships? Um, how can we leverage the relationships that we have, um, whether that's across large distances or within our you know, local communities with the uh, coffee drinkers that we connect with on a daily basis? Um, you know, what are the things that, uh, that the messages that we are able to convey? What kind of um, examples can we set? You know, what are um, the the actions that uh, that consumers as a group or um, or even thinking beyond uh, consumers that uh, a coalition of more consuming side actors could potentially um, push ahead or, or the leverage that um, that we have so uh, I would say it's you know it's definitely a combination of, of both and that I would be really eager for examples of, um, of how that is um, you know how that's working, or um, especially if that's happening on a, a local level or a, an international level. You know, um, companies that are partnering with uh, with government agencies, or um, 
whether in production or um, in consuming side countries or states in the United States, or even if possible, like at a city or municipal level. Liron, I unmuted you. If you wanted to add anything. It looks like they went back on mute, so I will take that as a no. Um, thank you, Kim. Um, let's see. Here's another question from Emmanuel. I have recently shared a list of roasters that are delivering coffee. Someone responded, thank you for sharing this list of roasters that will um, that I will never buy coffee beans from anymore. The argument being that coffee is not essential and that we should stop using delivery and potentially participate in the pandemic. I am torn by the subject because I know delivery options support small businesses, but promoting deliveries goes against the strict lockdown. Does SCA um, have a position on this? Well, I think you know the answer to the the SCA have a position on this specifically. I think that the again, the most uh, precise answer to that would be no, that we haven't uh, taken a position on this kind of specific um, situation. Uh, I think that you know we as an association are certainly in favor of ways to uh, you know that our the companies that are really struggling right now, the initiatives and the um, new ways in which companies are adapting to these challenging circumstances. And finding um, finding ways to connect to their community, ways to sustain their businesses. We're absolutely in favor of that, but also um, concerned about health and safety. Um, concerned about uh, about the health and safety of coffee drinkers, but then also you know the people who are working in these um, in these environments. So um, I don't want to you know ignore the short term in favor of the long term, but I do feel like in the context of a sustainability webinar. Um, I want to highlight the fact that you know, the precariousness of this circumstance and the fact that we are making, we are faced with what are pretty, you know, not great choices between um, uh, going out of business and um, expo potentially exposing people to a, a virus. Those are some, those are some pretty bad choices. So I would want to know for the future, think about, you know, how can we, um, when we're through this, or as we are thinking about the system that we want to build, um, you know, uh, try to build for um, circumstances that that don't include choices like like this. I think we have a comment from Isabella. So, Isabella, I'm going to unmute you. Hi. Hi. Hi, everyone. It's nice to to meet you all here. Um, my concern was because of the poll you did in the first uh, phase, I think it, it was really fruitful to learn how people see. However, we discussed it a lot in our company, uh, not to see the challenge of COVID separated from being sustainable. Um, as I wrote in a comment, we believe that sustainability is something that, as you said before, it is a big umbrella. It involves environmental issues, governance, social, and economic. And the COVID that we're facing right now is just a new variable to the equation of being sustainable. Uh, today is COVID, but we don't know in the in the future what might what might be. Maybe a problem with labor, with uh, taxes. We don't know. So um, we've been trying to include the challenge of sustainability of uh, COVID in our sustainable principles in the farm. And uh, from the production uh, side of, of uh, us, we have been, we haven't had any case of COVID in the farm and in the area, but we are facing harvest in the future. So we are very concerned about it, but we did a very good intensive training with the people in the farm so we help them to build up a plan and to learn that they could face a change because one of the most difficult things in a farm is to promote is to promote change 
because of the culture of a coffee farm. So we took advantage of that and uh, we trained the team and they came up with four scenarios to face the, the, the crisis right now. And uh, we are more than open to exchange best practice uh, with other producers, with other consumers. And uh, also as a coffee farm, I would like to express our support to the roasters that are trying to survive. We know that they're all being very careful in the production of their coffee and how to deliver it. And just to end, we believe that coffee can be a self-indulgence relief drink in the middle of the crisis. So as much as we can provide coffee, doesn't matter if it's online or it's through a supermarket, if it's not a very good quality at all because people maybe won't be able to pay, I think it's good to keep this chain. And um, we believe that all that means sustainability. So the, the power, the consumer power up to the end of the production we all must be together to make this chain strong enough to overcome this situation. Thank you. That's um, really, we, you know, generous yeah. take on sustainability and connectedness. Um, I want to uh, respond. This was a, a question that came from Maria that's related to what Isabella just said, Kim, and then, um, you know, there's a couple of hands raised as well. So we'll go to those hands raised. I see Jake and um, Christian and Erald. So we'll try uh, to get to all of you. So this question from Maria is related. So Maria asks, I'm really concerned about how the pandemic will affect the relationships we have in the entire coffee chain. <clears throat> When we can't roast or open the coffee shop to sell coffee, we can't buy more green or keep having positive ideas of trading it. You have been working for a long time developing the sustainability program for SCA. Did you consider in any of your discussions something like this pandemic, meaning not the virus itself, but any other climate change, unexpected situation affecting producers and others in the specialty coffee industry? Oh, great question. Um, <laughs> again, I think that the uh, the simple answer would be that no, you know, this was a, a, a pandemic or a disease was not the um, the threat that we were most acutely aware of. And you note climate change, and um, and that was certainly one of those. You know, uh, climate change is something that has been um, building for such a long time, has been in discussion for such a long time. It's a, a great example of something that's a you know. We have to think about over the long term. Um, there's no quick fix, but um, but at the same time that the impacts are being felt in the near term also. So it isn't just something that's uh, that's far away and on the horizon. Um, another you know another one of those uh, those priority areas for the association has been um, the profitability of coffee farming. Uh, Ellie mentioned the price crisis response initiative that we undertook in 2019. Um, as a result of the low levels of the commodity futures price for coffee. Um, and so that, again, was a, an example of something that's been building for a long time, um, but that has uh, manifestations that are, are you know, immediate. And um, I saw another chat message come in that, uh, that compared this um, virus to the effects of uh, coffee leaf rust in Central America a few years ago and noted that uh, that many coffee producers are still are still recovering. So while this um, threat takes a different guise than um, the ones that we have been more frequently discussing and uh, and holding webinars about and trying to you know, raise awareness of and, um, and drive action on or drive action against, I guess, if it's a threat, um, I think that probably a lot of the same kind of strategies and um, I'm always hesitant about using the word solutions because it feels like it oversimplifies complex things, but um, but the, the tools that we have at least uh, can be adapted to this circumstance also. Um, so when we talk about the need to uh, to maintain, you know, or the, the benefits of strong relationships and, and connectedness, that's not just um, because we feel isolated sitting 
inside in our homes, um, but also because those are real strengths that specialty coffee has to leverage in times of crisis. Wherever that crisis hits and whatever that form it takes, um, that's a you know a real benefit um, that uh, that specialty coffee offers. So I think that um, that uh, communication between value chain actors, um, buyers connecting to producers. We had you know, someone already offer from the production side support to uh, buyers, to roasters and, uh, and retailers in this time. Um, I think those are, uh, are important tools to, uh, to be employing on a, on a daily basis and to whatever degree, you know, whatever degree we can. But continuing to create space for that and prioritizing it, even if it seems sometimes like, well, there's, you know, there's nothing to say, or, or I don't know how my buying is going to be impacted. I don't know how much more we can do. Um, that might be something where uh, another roaster or a, another retailer has uh, has ideas that they can share, strategies that they are putting into place. Um, maybe someone who's been around since the uh, 2008 financial crisis, um, which was very different, but um, but you know, could uh, bring forward some of the some of their experiences and share those. I see that Jake has their hand raised. Um, so I'm going to unmute Jake. Hello, Jake, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Good morning, can you hear me? Hi. Hey. Did you have uh, a comment? Just, yeah, I just had a question, a kind of a comment, I guess. When you talk about getting government involved in, in solving solutions, usually you find out they create rules and paint 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 you into a box for solutions or or just don't really leave the market free to do what it needs to do. A lot of this sustainability is a is an upcharge. Uh, it costs more to be sustainable at the moment uh, through a lot of different avenues of the business. And it, it's, it's a significant buy-in. And in times like this, it's hard when you're sitting there trying to say, well, I need to start saving some cash to survive this and then I still need to go sustainable at the same time. So I just feel like if you start lobbying the government to make rules, it may push people into a hard spot where there is no choice but to surrender and and give up and walk away from the business as a whole because the entry into the sustainable part is too expensive. Uh, if you leave the government out of it and let consumers and suppliers and uh, businesses make those decisions. That I got to feel like that's a better choice than trying to get the government involved. I feel like a lot of sustainability revolves around education at the consumer level and then um, having good options at a, at a local level on what to do with it. So I just, when I heard you say getting the government involved, what does that equate to you as an association of lobbying them for some sort of change yeah there's a lot to respond to in uh in what you said and i think that um when it comes to lobbying as an activity um not only can it be very uh time consuming with um you know not a guaranteed uh payoff to that effort but um but you know sometimes uh, Sometimes it also involves a lot of trade-offs. And what I hear you uh, reacting to and maybe maybe bristling at a little bit is the idea that um, that uh, government involvement is going to involve more uh, more regulation, red tape, and ultimately increase costs um, at a time when people are already feeling stretched and feeling vulnerable. Um, and I think in that sense, I would agree that, uh, that yeah, that's, this is probably not a, a time when we want to encourage a lot of that we that we would want things to be easier more streamlined and efficient but you know i think that the um the role of government or the role of the public sector can be multifaceted um it isn't uh, only about making things more uh, difficult and uh, slow and expensive you know i think that there are um, essential supports that can be put in place um you know as an association you know, we have uh, we have people who um work with me and Ellie, uh, who live in countries all over the world, and seeing how different governments of our different staff members are responding to this crisis and uh, to support their citizens, it, it's—I mean, sometimes it's very inspiring, and other times it's kind of disheartening. 
um, especially as someone who, who lives in the United States. Um, so, uh, so there are ways in which governments can can provide some uh, much needed support also. And uh, and when you know when it comes to the costs of sustainability, um, I would even say, and this is again probably a, a subject for another webinar, that um, that the reason that sustainability is is seen as a cost is largely to do with um, the choices that we make or that have been made for us on a, a more societal level about um, what we assign costs to and how we value or don't value externalities. You know, I think that it would be um, worthwhile to consider that uh, if we were concerned about you know, public health and, um, and safety and uh, clean air and clean water and all of these other um, um, sustainability themes that often come up, like in the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, if all of those things were, were truly priorities, then um, those would be built into the cost of doing business and not seen as optional additional things that the well-meaning or the, um, the fringe activists in some cases would be, uh, would be suggesting everyone should do and more like uh, the sort of operationalized um, elements of a business that we don't even stop to think about because they're just part of how we have uh, how we see the world yeah i think um there just as a note we are getting a lot of questions about um you know how to stay um how to stick to our sustainability goals that are specific to the in person service, um, specifically with the barista or retail context. So a lot has to do with um, waste, uh, reusable materials, and a lot of those that are really forbidden or not possible right now. So I think that um, I just wanted to, we need to move on to the next discussion, but there are a number of questions that are going to be really appropriate, Kim, for us to take up with our team internally at the SCA and some resources that people are, are specifically asking for. So. I think um, if you've submitted that, we see it and um, we'll take that offline, but you know, just thank you for the ideas of what's important and providing value to you in the community now. So um, we're gonna move on to our final discussion point here in the last uh, 15 or so minutes that we have. And then we will actually end today's webinar with another poll, which has to do with the, selecting the topic for the next session. Um, so second discussion here, you can kind of read what we're really wanting to ask about this uh, long-term and short-term action. And in, um, in the, some of the questions, there was actually, I think, someone that asked really very, um, this question came from Audrey. So um, really great segue in transitioning to this tension between long-term and short-term action and how COVID-19 has made us feel this acutely. So we'd like you to reflect on this question below, but um, I'm going to start with Audrey's question, Kim. Curious if companies with a dedicated sustainability budget, e.g. percentage of revenue or otherwise, have been able to ensure sustainability remains a business priority throughout this crisis even if that means a shift toward investing in people right now over environmental and other sustainability priorities. How can we plan for the future through budgeting? So Kim, what are you hearing? Oh gosh, um, I was hoping, you know, I was wondering if we could even get anyone who's on the call who has uh, an experience to share. Maybe you could put that in the chat um, or raise oh, your hand and can unmute you. Um, because I, I feel like uh, this is a, because I would say that I haven't heard uh, I haven't heard a lot, and um, and part of that's probably on me that I haven't been asking uh, a lot. So that uh, poll that we did just a few minutes ago about you know where people's um, priorities are right now and and how sustainability is changing. Part of that is like honestly a um, an effort in in listening to. Uh, the community that's gathered here on this webinar, which is not a representative sample of the um, the industry, but um, in order to uh, get kind of a, a flash poll, if you will, in this survey um, on how people's how people are responding, um, I think that uh, that in times of crisis, and I think back to the you know the 2008 financial crisis because I was working in coffee then and working at a um, a coffee roasting company, you know that. Um, it would be 
yeah, I think it would it would not be fair to say that priorities didn't shift at the time and, and budgets didn't tighten substantially. But at the same time, the um, that company and the um, and many others who were involved in in sustainability and coffee and at the time, I mean, 2008, I feel like we were just beginning to wrap our heads around using that word. It still felt like um, it required a little bit of, of explanation uh, versus now when I feel like it's uh, ubiquitous to the point that um, you know sometimes it can work to the detriment of sustainability that uh, that everyone seems to to know what it is and um, in 2008 it, it wasn't quite that way so um, uh, so anyway the company that I worked for and others while priorities and, and budgets changed the fundamental commitment remained and um, and I think back to what I said earlier about the uh, opportunities that can be afforded by crisis um, I saw those and believing that that's possible here again gives me a lot of, uh, of hope and, um, and sometimes even a little bit of energy uh, because I think that there are, are many things that in the intervening however many 12 years uh, running up against the same problems again. Um, it can be, I think it can be sometimes disheartening to feel like you're having the same conversation over and over again. Um, I see that in people who've been in sustainability roles for many years. Um, and I think that moments like this offer a, a bigger, yeah, a bigger sort of a cultural examination um, than happens when at times when it feels like everything is good, um, then there's not as much a pressure to change. You can feel like, well, yeah, I mean, you know, we can probably do better, but I don't know. I'm looking at our business and it feels like things are pretty good. and. Um, and we're probably doing the right thing. Our customers say we're doing the right thing. We think we're doing great. Our suppliers seem happy with us. So where's the incentive? And now I feel like we have this moment where um, potentially there are some incentives that didn't exist before, uh, even if those are just um, driven by the one's own psychology, um, understanding that something here is is ultimately not working well. Oops. We have a couple of hands raised, so I wanted to um, check in with some of those folks. So, Chris Xian has had their hand raised for a little bit. Um, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you and see. Chris Xian. Okay. I think they may have um, had a different, different wanted to comment on something else because they're still muted. Um, and then there was also Roberto has their hand raised. Roberto, did you have a comment or a question? Hi, Roberto. I can hear some background noise. Okay. All right. Um, let's go ahead and move on to another question comment. Um, so this question is from Esteban, uh, hoping that after this crisis, we can go back to business. What changes do you see or recommend for the industry? What do you expect will change in terms of sustainability? Ooh. Um, you know, I think that, uh, We've already, I've already referred to, and I think Ellie has too, to um, this uh, price crisis response initiative that she and I spent a lot of time on with some of our colleagues and, uh, and industry peers over, um, over 2019. And um, while we are still anticipating the uh, publication of the report, um, that has been one of the SCA projects that has, uh, that has been put on hold as we've been you know, adapting in our own ways to this uh, new reality in this um, COVID-19 crisis, um, that a lot of that work really looked at the coffee industry uh, through the lens of systems change and as a, a system. So um, starting with the uh, low commodity futures price for coffee, but then um, not stopping there, not looking just at, uh, at how to, you know, how to change prices, how to, um, increase the price that a producer receives for their coffee or something that is important, but um, 
but pretty pretty surface level. It doesn't question you know, how that imbalance came to be, um, why the market works the way that it does, um, what is the role that uh, an individual buyer or that a, a membership trade association has in, um, in reinforcing some of the, the dynamics that keep producing these negative outcomes for, um, for coffee producers. And through that work, um, you know, we explored, we went way outside of just like the, the coffee price and, and outside of even just economic sustainability, if you think about a um, three part approach to sustainability, environmental, social, economic, that's a pretty common way of, uh, of characterizing sustainability. Um, and got into thinking about what's the role of, uh, of climate change and, and the risk that agricultural producers like uh, like coffee farmers bear in that. Um, what are the the social dynamics that contribute when farming is a household activity, not something that's just undertaken by one person? So through this broad exploration of uh, of coffee and the coffee system, one of the things that um, that we zeroed in on as being an area that was uh, really important for specialty coffee to continue to um, to delve into and to you know, raise awareness and ultimately lead some change on was the equitable distribution of value. Um, and again, in the, the lens of the coffee price crisis, that was something that we recognized most acutely or an imbalance between buyers and sellers of coffee, um, green coffee. Uh, but, um, you know, that, that same dynamic, that lack of recognition for value that someone is bringing to the final product of coffee, whether that's a coffee that someone buys at a grocery store and prepares at home for themselves, um, whether that's a, a shot of espresso that they buy at their favorite coffee shop, that um, not all that value is being recognized and the inequitable distribution of that. And that could be you know, from a perspective of a barista or the perspective of a, a farmer or a farm worker um, really threatens the future of specialty coffee. And that you know, we need to um, understand the value that uh, that we all bring to the that final product. Um, we need to understand the additional um, products that are coming out of this. Uh, maybe it's not just coffee. Maybe we're also creating a healthier ecosystem uh, on a farm that would have been dedicated to farming cattle otherwise. I mean, there's there's some good in this as well as some um, you know some tough stuff to to consider. So uh, I think that. That's what I would see as a, as what we will continue to see changing in terms of sustainability is um, there will uh, I think you know there will be ways in which uh, we can go back to normal and I think that there will also be ways in which we are this is a, an evolution and we have a, a different understanding now and we will than we did um, you know than we did a year ago even. Um. This is related. Um, this person um, wanted to remain anonymous, which is fine. Is there a plan or collaboration to help Origin? For example, Ethiopia now stops all shipments and exporting. Colombia is also about to start harvest. Not sure if our countries are ready for this. Supporting farmers and workers, <clears throat> but also balance health protocols with the sustainable economy of our farmers. And this will be the last, um, I think, yeah, we have about four minutes left. So this is either the last question or if we have time to squeeze in one more, we'll do yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, I think this is another um, another question or another area where um, we can really see taking a at least a two pronged approach, um, if not uh, if not more. But um, there's a level in which individual actors in coffee, um, if we're you know imagining that. Uh, if I put on my former coffee buyer hat and I'm looking at myself as a coffee buyer, then um, there's action that I can take through the coffee that I source. Um, there are, you know, I, I can't control the shipping schedule necessarily. I can't control certainly a, a port, a strike at a port, um, but there are uh, steps that I can take to stay in close contact with my coffee suppliers. There are, um, you know, commitments that I can make or there are uh, strategies that I can employ to um, to make substitutions where necessary, but uh, um, but do that with the you know the relationships that I have with coffee producers and producer organizations in mind. 
Um, uh, so even in times of uncertainty, I think we can still find ways to be true to our values individually. And then there are also um, there are also actions that can be taken at that institutional level, and that might be a government agency. To go back to what we discussed um, a few minutes ago about the role of the the public sector, but um, I think that that could also be at an institution like the SCA and a, an institution in a coffee producing country that is thinking about a um, that is thinking about coffee on the level of the the entire country, um, the needs of that country, not necessarily at the the you know the individual producer level or the individual container of coffee from a, a producer organization or an individual bag of coffee um, so i think that the you know we are we are at an advantage when we think about both of those and when we can coordinate action across both of those and we don't rely only on one that uh, rugged individualism that uh, leads sometimes people to think that uh, they can you know, work better without a system um, or circumvent the system. Uh, you know, I, I understand that temptation for sure, but, uh, I, but when we can coordinate the, um, the institutional action with the individual, I think that we have the best case of, uh, of succeeding, certainly in the long term, and in many cases in the short term uh, too, because so, many, so much of what is happening is really beyond the control um, of individuals, and that's a, that's a scary place to be in. Um, but it's not, I will just say, it's not an unfamiliar one for many people uh, in the coffee sector. Um, the idea of sort of being at the, the whim of, of another or being um, the victim of circumstances that are beyond yours to control is, uh, is more familiar to some than to others. Um, okay, and I'd like to just kind of close this with a comment from one of our attendees. This is from Dennis. So from living through a few past crises post 9-11, 2008 recession and now pandemic, I have observed that true sustainability is about resiliency and so the work continues. I'm looking at companies who have long-term thinking and business continuity plans that encompass sustainability and they will be fine. Poorly conceived sustainability efforts that are less impactful or based on donations won't survive. Um, and then I think this is a great reflection to just kind of leave with the group and maybe, you know, just to think about, we'll come together again in a couple days. Um, Dennis's question, what do people see in their own programs that will help evolve through this pandemic crisis? So this is just a reflection to leave you all with. And then I'm going to go ahead and launch our final poll. So um, we will be meeting again on Thursday. Thursday we'll have two meetings, so 3 a.m. Pacific time and 12 midday or noon Pacific time. Um, we want to get together and talk about living income. One of the reasons is that April 7th, which is next Tuesday, there um, our friends at the ICL Alliance are producing a longer virtual workshop on living income. And so those of you in the SCA community that might be interested in attending that, we wanted to make sure that we had a chance to come together and um, discuss that first. So <clears throat> here is the poll is open. And again, I'll have it open as long as we need to, about two minutes max, but at least a minute. Votes are coming in. So we just, um, there's a lot of different directions that we can go with living income and we just um, weren't really sure what our community was most interested in. So we wanted, we thought we'd just ask.
All right, we've got 80, 80%, 81%. I think most people who um, are still here have voted. I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll. So here are the results. So it looks like we will prepare an introduction um, to living income, a little bit of what work has been done. We already have a few experts in this arena that have volunteered to be part of this, so that's great. And um, we'll do we'll um, find a way to talk about both the farming farmer living income, which is the most of the work that has been done in the SCA community has focused on that, but considering the current need and um, pressure on baristas and retail workers. We will take a look at the barista living wage um, through that lens as well. Hopefully if we can recruit some experts on that <clears throat> area for us. And you know, certainly this won't be the only opportunity to have these discussions. All right, so um, in closing, we wanted to just um, remind you about the SEA COVID-19 research page and invite you to join us for our next webinars. Um, the, the, both of these will be delivered live. The uh, actual um, panelists might be a little bit different, um, but we ha will have the same topics roughly. And then these are um, this coming Thursday. And then a link below to the ICO Living Income webinar. This is a virtual workshop that takes place from 5 to 9.30 a.m. Pacific time. And um, there is a link to this as well in the download, which is on your dashboard under handouts. You can just download that PDF and all of these links are there as well as some of the other updates that we mentioned. So thank you all for your attentiveness and for your thoughtful contributions, questions, comments. Um, we have a lot to think about and a lot, uh, lot to do to provide the resources that you've asked for and we will get together with our teams and, and do that. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you on Thursday.